Welcome. Welcome to the Authors Hour. My name is Fred Zarm. I represent the Friends of the Chautauqua Writers Center. We are the sponsoring organization for this event. Our aim as a volunteer organization is to encourage writers and writing at the institution and beyond by supporting and also supplementing the activities of the institution's writers center. We do this by sponsoring many events. One is the author's hour every Thursday. A few others occur every week. On Sundays at five o'clock up on the second floor in the pros room at the back of the building, we have an open mic for writers and also auditors, listeners, uh, 18 years up. Most of us are up. Okay. Uh, on Tuesdays at 1.15 in the poetry room, we offer informal critique or writers who bring in one page of their prose or poetry. The critique is facilitated by a published writer, often me, but we have several others who rotate in. Um, if possible, bring some copies. Um, we say 10, but that's optimistic. It's usually a group of five or so people that will give you feedback for about, about an hour. Um, those are our weekly activities, the open mic, the informal critique, and office hour. At halftime, I'll talk about our special annual event. But let's get to the authors. The southern tier of upstate New York is special to Elisa Samarco, a third generation Chautauqua. She spent her summers at Chautauqua Institution and attended college at University of Rochester, where she earned a BA in economics and a minor in creative writing. Alisa is an attorney in Cincinnati, Ohio, but the beauty of this place brings her back again and again. Her poetry has appeared in print and online journals, including Sheila Nagate, Black Moon Magazine, Chain 7, Quiet Diamond, Main Street Rag, Evening Street Reviews, uh, Via, Voices in Italian Americana, Ohio Bards, but there was fire in the distance and hags on the fire. Interesting title. Her debut poetry book, Beyond the Dawn, will be released by yes. Turning Point Books in September of 2023. You can find more poetry and news at www. Alyssa, or Alisa, rather, A L I S S A, San Marco, S A M M A R C O, dot com. And her books will be for sale as well, Joanne. I give you Alisa. Thank you. So, I have to say thank you. This is, this is exciting. This is like really. I'm not nervous, but I'm so excited to be here. The mic okay? Is that better? Um, I'm so excited to be here. This is a place where I spent many, many years. Thank you, Mr. Milk. Um, and uh, many years and many summers uh, growing up, uh, going to the shows, uh, the lake, uh, before it became what it is, a little bit uh, unhappy. So um, I am an attorney and I am a poet and uh, I have handed out to you a book of ekphrastic poetry. Ekphrastic is a term meaning in response to visual art. It is poetry in response to visual art. This was a very special project for me to do. My mother passed in 2017 from cancer um, and she had shown her work actively uh, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and then of course, life takes a different turn if you a nurse. She had a crazy life, as most artists do, but hers was particularly crazy. She was the rocket. Uh, she uh, went to New York City by herself against all uh, advice and admonishment from friends and family. Um, she graduated from Greensboro Women's College uh, when a lot of women didn't graduate from college. Uh, 
uh, he traveled around in a traveling puppet show teaching kids about dental hygiene in the back of a station wagon with her best friend. So these are just some of the things um, that this comes from. And when I went to write poetry about her art, I looked at the images and I couldn't write anything. There were about 10, 15 really bad poems. And then I closed my eyes and I forgot about the images and just remembered how the art felt. And in that moment, I was able to bring out a poem that really reflected, partly partly reflects my mother and her life, and partly it reflects the art itself. And that's the essence of extractic, ex, ex, I can't even say it, I had to look it up, extractic poetry. I'm going to read you a few pieces out of that, and I did give you the brochure, and I wanted to just take a look so that you can also have an experience between the art and the poetry. So, Flo, are you still able to breathe after holding your breath for so long? You dip down below the surface and reach in gulps that look effortless. Each time you dive, seeking treasures forgotten in the flow of sifting sand, those nuggets of gold and so heavy they drown you. Near the end, we could talk. And you didn't remember the ants that burned under the magnifying glass or the sound the dog made when he snored. You didn't remember how I was terrified there was a monster in the face. Nugget, now lost to this flow. This is, this is uh, actually probably one of my favorite pieces called The Conversation. Your words tumble like rocks in the current, rapids roaring, turning into smooth and round and polished, like your art tumbled from fingertips dipped in paint and splattered across canvas. All the dreams you thought were lost after the children were born and the marriage ended. All of them leaving you that empty house. You filled it again over days and nights with friends, lovers, friends who will be lovers. Those dreams hung like clouds, almost never ready to rain, almost never raining. And the dreams of handsome, dark haired men, they came back to you just when you'd forgotten how much you wanted them. So I'm going to just read one more from this series, and then I'm going to there's some other pieces and some other works with you. This is more of a, a lyrical poem, and it's a little more of these. Abstract. Why did I come to you in this rabbit hat kind of way, paddling soft feet through labyrinths, tipping his head this way and that? peeking around corners to see who might be hiding. Why did you take me and embrace me into your bed, calm the trembling, twisting, frightful fallacy, make one body out of four legs, four arms, and two mouths, touching and parting and touching, feeling everything in abstract, just for that moment I am here. So these are some very recent works. As I said, they were written specifically for an art show, which is currently hanging in Cincinnati. But my real excitement, my baby right now, is a book called Beyond the Dawn. And it is a book of love poems. Uh, it is going to be released in September. Uh, and you can pre-order the book here and I'll it to you. Beyond the Dawn is a journey. And I want you to walk with me through this journey with these two young lovers as they walk from their honeymoon across the sands, the beaches where they are, into a bit of ennui as things often happen between a couple. And where they finally end up is a place of comfort and support for each other. Now, there are short poems. My husband likes to sell them as, you write short poems. 
this is a poem, and I think probably if we were all honest, might agree that some of our relationships actually started this way. Sitting on the veranda, Martin asked Jane, do you want another? They drank gin martini. He complained about the wind messing their hair, but he didn't care. He just wanted to get blasted. Try to show him. <laughs> Traveling together, pack your bags and I will come find you with your brown striped cape waiting for the rain to stop. You brought a brush for your hair, a razor for your skin, a cap for your head, and two tickets. My bag is packed with sparkles. Unexpected. A moment we missed. You kept it, and like a schoolboy, passed a note to the girl in the front row, pretending not to know how your eyes traced the curve of her neck. I took that note, slipped it in my pocket, favoring. And this book does have some more lyrical pieces in it, and I'd like to read one. It's a little called Nashville. And if anybody's a musician here and would love to work with me on making this a song, please call me. Nashville, you caught me at 3 a.m. chatting with my secret friend, insomnia hides my dreams of Nashville and lover scenes, while writing in the dark, lying starred and broken words still yet unspoken. And always I'd rather be sleeping, your hand resting on mine, your chest rising with my breath. Breath, that is my master. So, there, there are moments, I think, in a relationship where there's some questioning. And this um, beyond the dog does look at some of those moments. A moment amidst strangers, one kiss and I melted making promises unasked. And you held me tight in your corpulent embrace, harboring dreams I did not know. Then you pulled away, stealing your heart. And in that moment, intimate amidst a thousand eyes, pretending it was nothing. I think we may have all felt that way when maybe things weren't quite what you thought they were, or as people flipped back and forth. Gin martinis, the gin martinis we drank put clouds in my eyes and that drifted between your fingers and my skin. And I don't know why I am naked before you, bare and trembling, talking about tomorrows and leaving behind the temples where we used to worship. Mm. I'm sorry, I'm slipping. There is a poem that I really need to share because it, it addresses some of the ennui that sometimes comes between couples. Ennui is a very special French word that means I'm bored. Lunch being alone in French subtitle. He recommended the dish broccolini and pine nuts. The table was bare, except for a water bottle. No complicated patterns decorated the fare, just a half full bistro and a man on the phone speaking in French subtitle that I could not help reading as they scrolled across the room. But it does really speak to a place some couples get to. I think all couples get to that place. So I know you're all dying to know what I did in my youth here. Okay, I'm not going to tell you. 
but I I want to give you a sneak peek at um, what comes next in terms of my books. I have another book that's coming out in January of 2024, and it is called I See Them Now. There are several poems in this which were inspired by my uh, my youth here in Chautauqua. Some of my friends are probably in them. You are. Um, but they are, um, they're wonderful memories. And I wanted to share them, uh, especially since I'm here. Well, who is old enough to remember um, if you weren't allowed, when you were a kid, you weren't allowed to make noise in the evening? <laughs> yes, we are. And we all remember that there were certain houses you knew not to make noise anywhere near ever because there was always this. <laughs> um, but you know that little that was made, it was like louder than anything because you knew you would cross the line. This is really not about crossing the line, but it does bring back that memory. When boys and girls dream of one another, I remember all those years ago when I was happy and you were too. We spent our summers giggling, flirting with camp counselors. All of us named the same, Alan, Lisa, Elise. We spent our days in sunbathing in Sunday suits, pulling lake grass from our toes, squealing when it brushed our bellies as we swam, laying on docks and sunkissed bodies. Alice, Lisa, Elise, we ran everywhere, too excited to walk, too impatient to wait one second more to meet up at the rock. That's a rock. It's memorial black, long, red. We made noise until the old ladies shook the window, floral nightgowns waving us home. We scattered into the lamplight, boys and girls dreaming of one another. I want to ask who has been here in the winter time. So when you walk down these streets in the winter, it is a different world. It's transformed by the snow, it's transformed by the unwrapping of each house in Kansas. And this is what what it brought for me. Russian palaces, I visited my summer place, walking through the painted ladies, their porches bound tight to protect them from winter. It transformed them into Russian palaces, buried in antiquity under drifts of snow. I remember boys who pulled my braids and girls giggling our heads together. Some lost forever to our father above. Others lost their own demons and those who return to this place to raise their children here where time is wrapped in canvas drought like we have. Um, and I wanted to share I wanted to share a couple of more fun poems about, our, about kids, about silliness. So I'm going to read A Boy at the Gallery. I would have found him if he hadn't found me, standing apart from everything in the gallery, surrounded by the suggestion of a thief with leaves of red or bright orange sunset carving of summer then. His bright, clear voice in the silence, it seemed loud, announcing his chicken dog dance to the crowd. Who stood in front of him, pale face in the crowd? You know I made it up, and he shot his arrow across the room. Yes, watching it strike the target of red, yellow, and blue. There's one more silly, and you know, I'm Turn over to our next poet. The Unicorn and the Whale. 
with happy bedfellows, the unicorn and the whale, living one on land and the other in the sea, magic sprouted wings and they took in, took off into the air. Cyclone spin lifting them high, feathers abound, wax and gum melting, melting, kissed by the sun, their hearts beating faster, they turn, they could not hold their breath, exhaling at the wind's death and falling like all lovers fall, peace by peace, back to earth. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alisa, for that mixture of uh, playful and quite serious poetry. Just a few announcements before we get to our next author. Uh, some of the annual events that the Friends of the Chicago Writers Center sponsor, as a matter of fact, almost all of them at this point in the season have passed. But I do want to remind you of what. Uh, will unfold in 2024. We start the season with a reception for friends, light refreshments served on this porch. Shortly after that, usually the second or third Sunday in the season, we sponsor a book fair called the Authors and Honors Book Fair. As the name indicates, it's for Chicago authors. We also sponsor the Robert Pinsky's favorite poem project that took place oh, a couple of weeks ago in the Hall of Philosophy. That's a time when Chautauquans selected Chautauquan who applied for the, uh, for the event get to read their favorite poems and briefly explain why that poem means so much to them. The annual literary arts contest for writers of all ages closed at the end of July. Our one remaining big annual event uh, occurs on Sunday at 2.30 when the winners of that contest will be announced. That's 2.30 in the Hall of Philosophy. Just one announcement for our sister art uh, theater. Um, it looks like they've gotten over their COVID pause and Tiny Father, their production of Tiny Father, a world premiere. I saw the first performance of that last Friday, and it is a wonderful play. I highly recommend it. Now on to our next writer. He's a writer and a poet, and also a yoga practitioner and instructor. He's worked on three continents. He practices yoga daily and occasionally teaches all kinds of people to breathe and move. He dreams of homesteading and dancing under the stars in the wilds of northwestern Pennsylvania on the Chicago land. Her poetry appears in Agape Review, Messina Magazine, In Flesh, and Pittsburgh Theological Journal. Joanne is the author of Trauma Informed Yoga, a toolbox for therapists, 47 Practices to Calm Balance, and Restore the Nervous System, as well as a new card deck, Trauma Informed Yoga Card Deck, 52 Self Guided Practices. Joanne Spence. Hello, lovely to see you all today. This is going to take, this reading is going to take three different forms. And I write a lot about yoga, but I thought rather than just telling you about it, maybe we do a little bit of practice. And some of you are like, oh no. <laughs> and some of you are like, oh, it will, it'll be very gentle, breathing. And you all look like you're breathing. Okay. And as you can tell, I'm from Pittsburgh. This is a Pittsburgh accent of 35 years. Before that, Australia. Before that, Britain. After we've done a little bit of practice, just to get ourselves here and ready, I'm going to share a little bit of the epilogue of why I wrote this book as my first book. 
And then I've been able to change hats completely and I'm working on a memoir called Sitting in Stardust, Grace Remembered in Poems, Prose, Practice and Prayers. And I'm going to try out some of my new material on you. So the first thing is I blew up these cards super big and these are part of the latest book that just came out in May. And they're really simple practice about how we be present in this moment. So if you would indulge me, this is an invitation. You can completely ignore me, or you can give something a try if you would like. So the first one is tuning in with this time, and this is with my dear friend, Kathy. Most of my family members and friends are appearing in here, and I'll show you them as we go through. So let's take a moment and listen to the sound of this time together. Have your eyes open or closed, whatever feels more comfortable. Noticing the sound, other sounds, something about the resonance of the vibration that brings us here, now, in this beautiful and serious moment of the beauty that we just heard from Alyssa. This one's a little bit more active. And it involves moving your arms. And this is my adorable nine-year-old goddaughter, Riley. She calls the clasping, hand clasping. And if you feel like it, we're going to inhale the hands in, exhale them away, inhale them up. Now you're going to have to really watch out here, exhaling down. You can like scratch your neighbor's ear or say, excuse me. Bringing your arms down. Let's try that again. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. A little bit of a stretch in those hands, those fingers. Exhale down. That was really good. If you were at my class this morning over in um, time. So we're not going to do these ones in the interest of time, but this is cat and cow. This is a nice little moving here fine, back and forward. If you've ever been to yoga, you've probably done something like this. Uh, that is Sage. Here is Kathy doing some lateral movement of the spine. Feels really good. You can really lean into your neighbor and say hi. This is my husband, and he's over the other side of the campus preparing for his first five-minute set of stand-up, so he can be here. The twisting the spine, something we need to do every day. We can try this one if you want. In fact, some of you are probably already doing it with my friend Joan. Seated pigeon. This is pretty tricky to do when you were on the floor. Sometimes it's done from with the belly down and sitting on the floor. But I love doing this, just sitting in the chair. But back to Riley. We're going to do sighing breath, and this is one of my favorites. And if you've ever been a teenager or you are a teenager, there's extra benefit if you roll your eyes. So it goes like this. Sigh, roll your eyes. Just let your hands come back down. So let's do that three times. Inhale. Oh, I love that eye rolling. And isn't that just how it feels sometimes? Sometimes we can match the breath, and it feels so good to do that. So as we close out the first part of my set, this is a little meditation called the Tree in Me, and this is Charini. And she is a uh, medical doctor. She's in her residency at the moment, and she kindly took some time out of her very busy schedule, which was wonderful. And this called the tree in me. So feel free to have your eyes open or closed. Feel your feet on the floor. There's so many trees. Please do focus on a tree. I see a tree so green, so tall, 
a tree welcoming to wolves. I see a tree inviting me to share my worries. Leave them with the roots, so I do. I am the tree and it is me. I feel grounded and strong, branching out in love, humble and free. Oh tree, thank you. Your steadfastness and connection to all things heals me. And this is a, an ending to this part. I like to do something called an offering. So this is many. Uh oh, that's my note. In many cultures and practices, this gesture has a meaning. And if you feel like you want to join me in that and just gaze at your fingertips. In yoga, the Sanskrit word is Anjali Mudra, and it means an offering. So every time that I practice, or teach practice, just take a moment to, to thank yourself for the offering that you're giving yourself. And even in these few moments, it was an offering of self-care and self-awareness. And not only is that a gift to you, but it's a gift to those around you. This is a book I wrote for therapists a few years ago. It came out during the pandemic. It was my first book. It's a little underwhelming releasing your first book during a pandemic. But I handed it in the manuscript the first day of lockdown and thought, because the world was in such turmoil. So this is a how-to manual for therapists and the why of this book is woven throughout and it's based on an ancient practice and modern neuroscience. However, the following excerpt is from the epilogue, and it's my personal why, or why anybody might practice yoga, or and why anybody might spend the time that it takes to write a book. I have thought a lot about where and how yoga practices, such as the ones presented in this book, can be effective. And I realized that in the context in which I present them here, the, pra the practices represent interventions that can be utilized in certain circumstances or situations, like using the breath to mitigate feelings of anxiety. Certainly, I have observed and the studies support this downstream focus of yoga practice. However, it is also true that yoga shines its brightest when applied upstream as a preventative measure. And when we remain curious, open-hearted, and open-handed with our practice. Upstream success is quiet and often hard to see. And it's even harder to quantify because it solves problems before they arise. These practices like the ones we just did, can bring about incremental changes that support the whole person and all the systems of the body, which is why I encourage daily practice. If trauma is about rupture, then yoga is about connection, integration, and unity. It is about well-being and human flourishing. Although there are many documented benefits to practicing yoga, it is the mental health benefit that I am most passionate about. About a year ago, I realized that I had made this point strongly when my son Luca asked if he could come, asked me to come and teach a weekly yoga class at his school during his final few months of high school. Such requests are rare and precious. Needless to say, I quickly called teachers and administrators to clear the way. Because I was only teaching once a week for six weeks, I didn't have much time to make my points about yoga's mental health benefits. But as you will have noted from this book, giving someone the experience of a practice, as we just did rather than just tell you about them, is much more powerful than simply describing and explaining it. Still, I wanted these precious but sleepy high schoolers to have knowledge and experience, and I did, the, I did my best to give them both. About four weeks in, I did a review of what we've covered so far. 
So what's the main reason we do yoga? Surprisingly, some hands shut up. I wasn't even sure that they were awake yet. And a tenth grader blurted out, so we don't kill ourselves. I wasn't quite ready for the starkness of the comment, but he was spot on. I had repeatedly stated in class that practicing yoga was a way to care for yourself and to gain self-awareness. We had talked about the awareness that yoga brings and the importance of noticing our feelings and asking for help. When our six weeks together ended, even the initial reluctant students were sad to finish. Here's a reality I would like you to know. I have had to lean into and practice every single practice in this book multiple times, along with some of the ones we just did, to manage my own mental and physical health and well-being during this process of writing it. I had to. And not just because I was writing about the practice, although that certainly was a factor, but because life is hard, beautiful, and messy. Life inevitably comes with its ups and downs. And having some of these practices as part of my daily routine helped me to get out of bed in the morning. So there's that. And writing about any topic that has the word trauma in it, day in and day out for many months, is fraught with other people's suffering, not unsimilar to that of being a therapist. I wrote the book for therapists. And like you, I have had to stand my ground and be consistent with my own self-care to make it through this season. And as Dr. Albert Wong pointed out, what we think and how we act matters. But it's not all that matters. How we feel in our bodies matters too. Or learning to feel in our bodies. My learning curve has been steep as I've come to terms with my own trauma which is probably why I teach what I need to learn. I believe we all do to varying degrees. So to that end, as we learn to feel with our bodies, we heal. I have healed. I am healing. I desire to be a regulating force in the world so people in my orbit can learn to do it for themselves. This last part, I'm going to read the title poem to a, a memoir in a mixed media memoir in poetry. If I can find it. So, this project tells stories from my life as it relates to remember, remember, remembering my childhood years as a young immigrant in Australia, some of the tender losses I've experienced over a lifetime and God's grace in everything. And it was written with my, I'm writing the memoir with my own children in mind so that they have a legacy of these aspects of my life that happened before they existed. And I chose to write primarily with poems because poetry slows us down. And it slows us down enough to notice the joy and the beauty of life and to savor it. That's how I felt when I was listening to your poems. Poems can also help us to lament the losses. So in these remaining minutes here, this is the title poem for Sitting in Stata. And I'll just give you a little heads up. I write with footnotes. I love a good footnote. And I even use footnotes in poetry um, after my poetry teacher, Ross Gay, showed me that that was a thing. Sitting in stardust, star night, star bright, first starry sea, scratch that, star bright, starlight, first starry sea, scratch that. You are as fragile as ashes, as precious as stardust. Footnote, from the Reverend Mark Winters, Ash Wednesday Liberty at the imposition of ashes. You are stardust, vast mysterious, incomprehensible. You are the ineffable, the untellable telling. Together, 
you and I are deep in the heart of the universe. Of song, of silence, of wilderness, we roam, grounded in the earthy soil of treehood as the saints of old gather and listen. Together, we hear the whispery chant, the fragile of ashes, the precious of data, over and over until the night sky is clear and bright and silent. So delicate and velvety as the faintest of stars become mere pinpoints of light. Ashes. From dust we come, from dust we return. Humble and small beginning. Humble and small ending. How far we often stray in between these two bookends of life and death. God lets us co-create the in-between. The space is wide open for our interpretation of who we are, who we will be. My heart is open right now to my smallness and all my finitude. The smudge is a reminder that I am not alone. must not be at the one minute mark because Fred is not standing yet. <laughs> so I'm going to end it with a poem that I wrote for my husband. It's in Macrina magazine. It's called A Homily on Change. Dreams have a funny way of making themselves known eventually. They evolve over time. Some recur. Same old, same old. Some days I'm fascinated with death and the life beyond. But in the now, have I told you how much you mean to me? Have I spelled out my love to you recently? One, four, three is all it takes. That's Fred Rogers code for I love you. So simple. Perhaps we forget that our time here is sleeping. The blink of an eye, it's easy to forget. To major on the unimportant, the urgent, the crisis. But for the moment, let me remind you of the easy thing. Watching the sunset together in silence, holding your hand as we walk the neighborhood, sinking into your chest as your arms surround me, feeling safe and protected. So much easier than fixing rooms, easier than cleaning out the basement, easier than washing dishes. Our lives are made up of thousands of mundane moments. Pure joy, lest we forget. Thank you. I'm reminded of the old Johnny Mitchell lyrics. We have stardust, we have golden, and we've got to get our back to the garden. Uh, I want to remind you of some upcoming events before we call it a day here. At 3.30, the CLSC author of the week, Ash Davidson, will be speaking about her book, Stand Making Strength in the Hall of Philosophy. Tonight at 7 o'clock, in the ballroom, we have a special event, Fast Ballads, dedicated to um, the slightly resurgent denizen of Chautauqua, once very numerous, the Bat, uh, the Bat Lady, Carolyn Thistle will be speaking, and some poetry and prose will be read about that. And then there'll be an open mic session to do with half of who that has something, anything to do with Bat. You're welcome to read it, and you're certainly welcome to come listen. Sunday at 2.30, as I already mentioned, there will be the award ceremony for this year's writing contest. At 3.30, next week's Writers in Residence poet Ralph Black and prose writer Michael Marton will be speaking. And I do certainly invite you to come again next week to the Author's Hour. Um, 
Doug Miller, a longtime Chautauquan, will be reading from his very fascinating nonfiction book, The Greatest Escape. I believe the CLSD had a book to do yesterday here of it. It's about um, an actual prison escape from a Confederate prison by a great many uh, Union soldiers. Um, then we'll have Dr. Fahida Aziz speaking about um, basically end of life care. Uh, he has a book, Courageous Conversations About Dying, that's very useful when thinking about end of life. Anyway, thank you for coming today. Hope to see you next week. Take care. Bye. Brown autograph talk. <laughs>